welcome to the Oceano Dunes State Vehicular Recreation Area. My name is Francesca. I am a state park interpreter working for California State Parks here along the central coast of California at the Oceano Dunes SVRA and at Pismo State Beach. Off in the distance behind me, you can see the waves of the Pacific Ocean crashing up along the shoreline. Off in the distance, you might be able to make out Point San Luis there in San Luis Obispo County. Um, we are at the bottom end of a large bay, which is important. We're gonna be talking about the geography of this coastline and how it helps to form this habitat that I'm standing in right now. And our plan for today's program is to teach you about this habitat. We're gonna learn about how sand dunes are formed. We're going to learn a little bit about the rock cycle and kind of refresh your memory on these processes um, that occur on long geological time scales to make up these incredible landscapes. And then we're also gonna learn about some of the endangered species that live out here in our state parks and specifically right along the shoreline, we have some nesting birds that are on the endangered species list. And our park scientists and my colleagues work very hard to protect these species. Um, so I wanna teach you about them and teach you how you can help. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about different careers that you could have if you are interested in environmental science, biology, marine science, education, or even communication or tourism. So I look forward to working with you um, and let's go ahead and get started. All right, well, the first thing I wanna do is kind of introduce you to where I am standing and where this park is located. So for this, let's pull up a map. This is a map of North America. And if you find that little blue dot, you'll see that is right along the coast of Central California. Let's zoom in a little bit further. And now you're seeing San Luis Obispo County. And as you closely observe this map, you might even be noticing the different shades of colors along the coastline. Can anyone notice that white, shiny, glary part that's shining up from where the coastal sand dunes are? Excellent, let's zoom in a little bit further and now with our bird's eye view, we're actually in a drone floating up above the coastal sand dune habitat. Now, you may have traveled to the coast of California before and haven't seen this habitat before and that's because this area where I'm standing is unique. This is one of the largest coastal sand dunes on the entire west coast. Now you're probably wondering why these sand dunes don't exist in other areas along our coastline. And the answer to that question has to do with the geography of the land. So let's take another look at a map here and notice how the coastline is shaped. The shape of the coastline actually dictates the type of sand and rocks in cliffs or flat beaches that will occur in any given area. Here along the south coast of the San Luis Obispo County area, here along Pismo Beach, Grover Beach, and Oceano, you'll see there is a big, flat, long beach that runs for over 20 miles. So now that we kind of understand the shape of this coastline, I want us to start thinking about another question. And that is, where does the sand actually come from? Many people think the sand comes from the ocean because after all, the ocean is right next to the beach. And that is partially true. But before the sand ends up in the ocean, it actually travels from quite far distances sometimes sometimes up to hundreds of miles away. So to understand about how this sand is traveling, we need to start thinking about the rock cycle, which you might remember from back in elementary school, the different types of rocks you learned about and the different processes of erosion and weathering that cause rocks to turn into sand. So let's take a look at this process. Here in California, large mountains exist inland from the coast. These mountain ranges lay parallel to the Pacific Ocean and are formed by layers of cooled magma, also known as igneous rocks. High up in these mountain ranges in central California, granite rocks and sandstone boulders dominate the landscape. Rivers and creeks are formed around these large rocks. When it rains high up in the mountains, the strong force of the water flowing down the rivers causes the rock to erode into smaller rocks. 
Weathering is when these rocks get rained on, the rain and the processes up in the creek turn these large rocks into slightly smaller rocks. The smaller rocks then turn into smaller, tinier rocks, and eventually as the process continues and as the creek winds its way down through the mountains and out onto the beach, you end up with tiny rocks known as sand. Now here we have the Arroyo Grande Creek flowing out into the Pacific Ocean. And as you know, those rocks were broken up into tinier pieces, tinier rocks, small sand particles. The sand particles are now washed out through the creek and into the ocean. And once that sand flows out through the river into the Pacific Ocean, more amazing forces are at play. Out in the ocean, you can probably hear it today, we have some pretty large surf that consistently pounds up against the shoreline here. Which is why, especially along the central and northern coast of California, we recommend only swimming within your abilities and surfing within your abilities. Never go alone and make sure you have someone with you um, knowing your plan of where you're gonna go in case you might need help. So these fun, large waves are cool for us humans to play in, but have you ever thought about what's actually happening underwater? When the waves crash and break onto the shoreline, the sandy bottoms are also getting churned up. And in that process, the grains of sand are getting finer and finer. Eventually, they're light enough that the waves actually push them right up along the shoreline. As the sand sits along the shoreline, the tides are also at play. And I know you've learned about tides. We have two high tides and two low tides every single day. The tides are controlled by the gravitational pull of the moon. So a very predictable force at play there. And as the tide is high, it brings up sand onto the beach. But as the tide recedes, it leaves behind the sand and some rocks. And the process that happens next actually comes from the sun. So I have my hat on today. It is very bright and very glary. Um, most days out here, not many trees, not much shade. And that sun quickly dries out along the shoreline. Once that sand is dry, the next force at play, which you probably also hear on my microphone and see my hair blowing, is another consistent natural force. And that is the wind. So the wind here pretty consistently blows from the north west and as it blows on land that wind is actually carrying sand particles up into the dunes so it's transporting sand in a process we call saltation so without the wind we would not have the sand dunes the wind is kind of the force or the transport mode to get the sand higher up into this habitat and once the sand is in the habitat up here the sand is always shifting so the cool thing about this habitat is it's very dynamic or very ever-changing. No two sand dunes are ever alike because the wind and the sand are always compiling up on it differently. And some days when you're out here, you can actually see dunes forming right before your eyes. But in general, these processes do take time. To create large sand dunes like these ones out here behind me today can take geological time scales. We're talking hundreds and thousands of years to build up this process of creating large sand dunes. Now as the sand is blown from the beach up onto the shoreline, you'll notice I'm about 100, 200 yards from the breaking waves right now and I'm up above the beach on what's called a fore dune. And the fore dune right here, parallel to the beach, is the first obstacle that the sand is going to run into. Now past the fore dune, looking to the east a bit more, you'll notice the dunes start to get taller up above my head. And way back off in the distance, we have what we call our mature sand dunes. Now these dunes can be up to 100 feet tall. So let's learn a little bit more about the structure of a sand dune. Looking out into the sand dune habitat, the pattern that is formed within the sand is predictable based on the direction of the wind. As the wind blows here in an easterly direction, it carries the sand particles up onto one another, compiling up into what's known as dunes. But on the backside of a dune, we have what's called a slip face or the steep 
angle downward into what's known as the bowl or the bottom of a dune. The angle of repose refers to the angle or the steepness of a slip face. And once that angle reaches 33 degrees, it becomes too steep for the sand to keep compiling on itself. And eventually those sand particles fall down into the bowl. Understanding this pattern of the dune slope versus the slip faced will help you when you're out exploring in the dune habitat and you can find your way as you're navigating in different directions. Great, now that we've learned about how sand dunes are formed, let's start thinking about the sand dunes as a habitat or a home for different species. First, I want us to dive a little bit into some of the plants that have adapted to survive out here. At first glance, it may appear as no plants could possibly survive in this barren landscape. But looking closer, you'll discover certain species have adapted to grow in the sand, including this silver dune lupin. The silver dune lupin is native to California. When a plant is native, it means that it grows in a certain area naturally and has existed in this place for a long time. The silver dune lupin is in the same family as peas. You can tell you're looking at this plant if it seems to have silvery, soft, hairy leaves. These leaves will be on the plant the entire year, helping to trap water droplets while also performing photosynthesis to give the plant energy to grow and give out fresh oxygen into the air. Taking a closer look at these leaves, you'll see that they're classified as palmate leaves, which means that they look an awful lot like the palm of your hand, where the leaves are like fingers of your hand. These leaves are designed to trap water and channel it down to the stem and into the soil. Now let's take a closer look at these leaves under a microscope. And you'll notice another cool adaptation. Do you see all of those hair-like substances? Hairy leaves help plants regulate the temperature and reduce the evaporation rate, thereby helping it conserve water and survive in the harsh dunes. Up next is another flowering plant that survives in the dunes. It also has a purplish pink flower, and this species is known as the pink sand verbena. This species has also adapted to live in the sandy soils by having the same adaptation structurally to their leaves by having tiny little hairy particles on the outside to protect it from the harsh, dry environment and to conserve water. Many other species of plants that have learned how to survive and adapt to this harsh environment, but now let's move on and take a look at some of the animals. And now that we have learned about these plant species, let's take a look at some of the animals who have also learned to coexist and adapt to live in this harsh environment. Now, right off the bat, thinking about surviving in the sand dune or even along the open coastal habitat, there is a lot of natural elements at play. The sun shines very relentlessly. I have my hat on today always wear sunscreen out here as well, but animals, they have to adapt to this get sun protection of their own, which is one of the first things you will notice, that a lot of these animals burrow to find their shelter and to escape the heat during the daytime. So it's almost similar to some of the animals you may have studied in the desert habitats that are more nocturnal and hide out during the daytime. The other thing to think about is the availability of water. Now we learn some of those incredible adaptations from the plants to conserve water, but what about animals? So I want us to think about water. Sure, there is lots of open Pacific salty ocean water here, but we don't get a ton of rainfall here. And the animals surviving out here have to be clever with their adaptation to find or to convert water. So let's dive in and learn about some of my favorite animals that live here in the dunes. The first animal we'll learn about lives inside of this hole. Can anyone guess what animal is hiding just below the sandy surface? Take a look at that long line, that tail mark. It's not from a snake or a reptile. It's actually from a rodent. What if I were to show you this cool picture of two burrowing kangaroo rats? Now you can picture where that tail mark came from. Understanding the anatomy or body structure of this animal lets us understand how it's able to survive. It has a long tail, 
two thick hind legs and short little paws up front that are perfect for burrowing. Kangaroo rats burrow under the sand to seek shelter and to find protection. Under these tunnels, it's also a perfect place for them to store their seeds. Kangaroo rats are nocturnal and gather seeds at night from plants around the dunes, such as grass and other native species. After they collect those seeds, they do something quite clever. Now they don't have very large hands, but they can actually store the seeds inside of these pockets inside their cheeks. They're related to the pocket mouse, which also have these pockets here. And if it were a human, it would be the equivalent of being able to put an entire grapefruit into each side of your cheek. Now these seeds are not only important because it provides them energy and food, but from these seeds, the kangaroo rats will get all of the water that they need to survive. That's right, they're not gonna be drinking water out of puddles. Instead, they're gonna be getting water from their food. Now we know that plants don't seed year round, which means the kangaroo rats have to conserve these seeds. They have to make them last year round by storing them in their tunnel systems. So their burrows not only act as shelter and protection for their bodies to escape from predators, but it also acts kind of as a refrigerator or a pantry for them to store these seeds in year round. Scientists here at our park are interested in studying small mammals, including the kangaroo rats. Specifically, scientists are interested in tracking the movement of the kangaroo rats throughout the park. They'll place a small non-invasive tag that has an ID number on the ears of the kangaroo rats, and then they will trace them throughout the park to follow their movements. This graph here shows the movement of a tagged kangaroo rat, which you can see they're quite active, moving along quite large areas of the open sandy dune habitat perhaps to find food, perhaps to find a mate. Our scientists are interested in finding the answer to these questions. And next up on our list of animals that have incredible adaptations to survive in the dunes is the silvery legless lizard. Now let's take a look at this video of a legless lizard crawling along the sandy habitat in the dunes. Before you know it, it starts to literally disappear right before your eyes as it burrows underneath the sand, which we now have learned is an incredibly smart adaptation to hide from predators and to escape the heat underground. Now you might be wondering why is the legless lizard not a snake? It looks an awful lot like a snake. The difference has to do with the details. Lizards have eyelids and the legless lizard does have eyelids. It also has the ability for it to lose its tail. Now snakes don't have eyelids and they don't have this ability to lose its tail. So therefore it's a distinguishable difference than a snake. Great, I love learning about the kangaroo rat and the legless lizard, two really fascinating species that are thriving out here in this habitat. The next two animals I want to talk to you about are actually two different types of birds. We have the threatened western snowy plover and the endangered California least tern. Now you notice these animals are classified as threatened and endangered, which means they are recognized by the federal and state government as needing protection. So here at California State Parks, part of our mission is to protect these species um, to research ways we can protect their habitat and the actual animal to make sure they are getting what they need naturally out here. So let's learn about these two bird species. The western snowy plover is a small shorebird measuring only about six inches long. It is classified as being a threatened species, which means our park scientists are keeping extra close track of this animal, especially during its nesting season. The snowy plovers have a habitat range that goes all the way along the west coast of the United States, from up in Washington State, down through Baja California, Mexico. Snowy plovers can be found on the shoreline and up into the foredune habitat. tiny birds build their nests, which are called scrapes, right directly into the sand. 
And as you can see, these tiny chicks are very small, only about the size of a cotton ball, making them very vulnerable to disturbances from humans and also from predators. Here in California State Parks, our biologists and natural resource managers keep a close eye and study this species. Western snowy plovers are being carefully monitored so we can track the populations and also track the movement of this species. Specially trained biologists know how to tag the newborn chicks and by placing these colored bands around their ankles when they are respotted at our beach or in other beaches throughout the region, scientists can communicate about different birds and be able to identify them through the colored bands. Can you spot the tiny, brightly colored bands on this western snowy plover? Great, now that you've learned about how scientists are protecting this bird by tracking them and studying them, you can also help this species. By following these simple rules, you can share the shore and be respectful when you visit the beach so you don't scare these tiny shorebirds, especially during their nesting season. So by keeping your pets on a leash, picking up your trash, and reading the signs that our scientists have posted, we can share the shoreline and have fun while we visit the beach and make sure the western snowy plover also has a safe place to exist within our beaches. Last but not least, the final animal I want to teach you about today is called the California least tern, which is classified as an endangered species. It was listed on the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1970 and on the California Endangered Species List in 1971. Now let's review the ranking system that scientists and the government use to classify different species. A threatened species is one that is likely to become endangered, such as the western snowy plover. An endangered species is one that is at risk of actually becoming extinct. So the California least tern critically needs our help and our protection. Have you ever seen a California least tern before? They spend their time on the coast of California from April through September, which is their breeding and nesting season. While there are several types of terns that can be found along the coast of California, there are distinguishing characteristics that help us identify the least tern. First of all, it is the smallest size tern. That's where it gets the name least. But it also has that distinguishable black cap, a yellow bill, the black outer edge of its wings, and the tops that are gray. And again, because this bird nests right along the shoreline during the busy summer months when us humans like to come to the beach, you can help out by being respectful and reading the signs, keeping your pets leashed, and keeping trash off of our beach. And now that we've learned about how environmental scientists are working here within California State Parks to help protect this habitat and the species that live here, I also want to talk to you about some other career opportunities within the California State Park system. So we talked about kind of the scientist track and maybe some of you are interested in going to college to study environmental science, marine science, biology, chemistry, lots of amazing opportunities in sciences. Um, but here within the state park system, there's lots of other opportunities. So let's dive in and learn about some of the other options. When people picture parks and the great outdoors, they also think of park rangers. Here within the California State Park System, our State Park Peace Officer Rangers serve as the law enforcement staff here at our parks. And working alongside our Rangers as first responders, we also have lifeguards. We hire lifeguards to staff the towers along our beaches in the summer and also to work year round as law enforcement State Park Peace Officer lifeguards working in our coastal parks and along California's waterways. Another cool career opportunity within California State Parks is our maintenance department. Maintenance aides are skilled workers that work in various locations throughout our parks. We also hire historians and archeologists to further understand the resources and protect the resources in our state parks. Next up, we have our California State Park interpreters. Interpreters serve as educators, educating children and the general public about things that they might find in the state parks. 
And last but not least, we have our hardworking team of park administrators working hard behind the scenes to make sure things run smoothly for all of our visitors and all of our employees. Now, if you're interested in any of these fun careers working for California State Parks, visit our website, livetheparkslife.com, and apply today. Great, thank you so much for joining me here today to learn about the coastal sand dune habitat at the Oceano Dunes SVRA. I hope you enjoyed learning about how these sand dunes are formed, what plants and animals live here, and some of the different careers that myself and my colleagues enjoy living the park's life every single day out here at California State Parks. So we hope to see you outside in the park when it's safe for you and your family to do so. We invite you to visit us here at the dunes or at one of our other 280 different California State Parks found throughout California. And we hope that you'll continue to explore and get out there and learn as much as you can about the world around you. So thanks so much. Again, I'm Francesca at the Oceano Dunes and we will see you in the park. And be sure to check us out and follow us on social media for more fun content. And teachers, you can check out our virtual field trips offered through the Ports program by visiting www.ports-ca.us to register your class today. Thank you.